Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Princeton Public Library. My name is Janie Herman, and I am the manager of adult programming. It's my great pleasure to introduce our author for the book brunch this morning. But first, a few housekeeping notes. I'll keep them quick. Uh, this room is equipped with a hearing loop that pairs with hearing aids using T-coil technology. If you need hearing assistance, uh, you can turn on your T-coil right now if you need it, or we also have headphones for your use if you would like. Just raise your hand and one of our staff will bring you the T-coil headphones. Uh, we kindly ask for you to silence your electronic devices and hold your questions. Uh, and there will be a chance for audience Q&A at the end of the presentation. Finally, we would like to extend our thanks to Labyrinth Books of Princeton for being our bookseller today, as well as to Atria Books and Ariel Fredman in particular for making this event possible. Uh, we are truly honored to have Frederick Bachman here with us this morning as our first author event for 2023. What a great way to start the year. <laughs> uh, joining Mr. Bachman today as moderator is local writer Amy Jo Burns. She is the author of the memoir Cinderland and the novel Shiner, and I highly recommend both of them. Her next novel, And Sons, is forthcoming in 2024, and we already have her on the calendar for a book talk whenever that is ready. Um, so this event is to celebrate the premiere of A Man Called Otto on January 13th, which is the new film adaptation of A Man Called Uwe, starring Tom Hanks, but also to discuss Frederick Bachman's newest novel, The Winners, the highly anticipated conclusion to the Beartown trilogy that explores questions of friendship, loyalty, loss, and identity, and brings readers back to the close-knit, resilient community for stories about first love, second chances, and last goodbyes. As I sat at the keyboard trying to figure out the best way to introduce one of my all-time favorite authors, I found myself wanting to write paragraph upon paragraph about how much his works have resonated with me since I first read A Man Called Bouvet when it came out, believe it or not, 10 years ago, in 2013. But you are not here to listen to me, so I reined myself in. <laughs> but I also didn't want to just read out his standard bio and list of books, because I know everybody in this room is well aware of all of that information. Then, yesterday, I received a note card from Sharanya Tuari, a young professional from Toronto who had been visiting her sister in Princeton, but had to fly home yesterday. She had expressed to our building monitor, Tom Ridge, how much she loved every single book by Frederick and how extremely disappointed she was to be missing the brunch today. So she asked for our staff to deliver him a note. By way of introduction, I would like to read a few snippets of what Sharanya wrote. Dear Mr. Bachman, I am a 23-year-old financial analyst from Canada, and I am in awe of your writing style. My favorite books all have two distinct qualities. One, they have characters that I would befriend in real life. And two, I would choose to re-experience them all over again if I had a magic wish to do so. <clears throat> your books have those qualities. Your characters tap into the authenticity of human nature while teaching us readers about love and family and life. So I want to express my gratitude for the way you have effortlessly portrayed the delicacy and charm of human emotion and connection through your books. So I think what Sharanya wrote sums up perfectly why this event sold out almost immediately and why we are all here today. Frederick Bachman writes stories with quirky, unique, relatable characters that make you realize that everyone is fighting their own battles and you never know their full story until you get to know them closer. His books resonate deep within, and they always stay with you long after you turn the last page. And so without further ado, please welcome Amy Jo Burns and Frederick Bachman. Hi, welcome to New Jersey. <laughs> we are so excited, not only that we got to have you as the first event, as Jamie said, of the year for the library, but um, you know, I don't know if you're not aware, uh, Frederick and his wife came in yesterday from Sweden. They're here for a few days. They're only doing you know, two book events, and one of them happens to be here. The other one is later on in the week in New York City. Uh, but we are so excited and honored that we got to host you. So thank you to you and your wife um, both for coming. I'm going to jump right in because I have a whole bunch of questions, and I know you all have a whole bunch of questions that you'd love to ask Frederick. Um, but since you know we're in a room full of your fans online as well, um, for anybody who doesn't know, could you just tell us how you got started as a novelist? Um, maybe the path that you took. 
Um, no, I probably couldn't because I don't know how that happened. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a plan. It was never. Um, I I never wanted to be an author. Mm -hmm. I still don't. <laughs> it, it's not my. It was never my intention. This this uh, the, the author thing happened. It was. That was a weird coincidence. It's. Uh, I wanted to be a storyteller. Mm -hmm. So I think I could have stumbled onto anything. Mm -hmm. I think if uh, uh, because when I was 25, 26, and didn't know what to do with my life, and mm -hmm. at that point where people start telling you like you need to figure this out, <laughs> um, and I've been doing a lot of things. I had a lot of I had a lot of jobs. I was an exterminator for a while. I was. Uh, I was a, a dishwasher at a restaurant for a while. I uh, I drove a forklift for a pretty long while. I uh, fruit warehouse. I um, did a lot of things. I studied religion for three years mm -hmm. at university. Uh, turns out that this it's not a, it doesn't take you anywhere really. <laughs> it's not a profession at the end of that yeah. life. And, uh, and, um, and I just had this thing that maybe I can. Maybe I can make a living from writing somehow. Mm -hmm. And I just figured that, well, I could probably write anything and make a living from it, and that would be better than writing a forklift. Yeah. <laughs> so I had no, there was no standard for me. I, I just, I did anything. And I wrote for free for a lot of magazines. Mm -hmm. I just, I kept emailing people, like, can I write something for you? And I'm like, no, you have no education, and we know nothing about you. And you're, I'm like, I'll do it for free, all right. <laughs> we have something. And this was, but I, I, but that was at a time, this is 15, 16, 17 years ago. So you do whatever, if you want to tell stories, then you do it with the things that are available to you at that time. And at that time, there were still magazines. Right. It's a very ancient thing. <laughs> there were actual magazines. And, um, so that's where I headed, mm -hmm. and um, and then the blog thing came. Uh, I don't want blogs anymore now because everything is TikTok or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but at that time, the blog was new, and no one knew what, what it was. It was like this can be anything. Mm -hmm. There are no rules. No one knows what it is, and uh, so I uh, so I started doing that, and and just found that to be my little playground. Mm -hmm. And that's how I, uh, so I started blogging and then I just tried to tell, it was a lot of, ad, it was a lot of dialogues between me and my wife, it was mm -hmm. a lot of, like, me and my wife is in a fight about this, <laughs> and I would recall the dialogue and then people would write in the comments, like, we're siding with your wife. <laughs> <laughs> that was basically the whole idea of the blog. But, uh, and then we had our first child, so I, I blogged about that. We got married, I blogged about that. that. And uh, I found a little audience, and it wasn't that big, but it, it was a little audience that I could like bounce ideas off of. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I found, I, I tell people, that's how I found the narrator voice for Michael Buba. Mm -hmm. Like the narrator voice is the voice that I used when I blogged. Mm -hmm. That's how I found that, because when when young writers start, when you start writing a novel, the thing that you find to be problematic at first is that you don't know what the narrator voice sounds like. Mm -hmm. Like who is who is the person telling the story? Like the invisible person telling us the story. What does that person sound like? How does that person phrase a sentence? And how does that like? Can that voice be funny? Mm -hmm. Can that voice have a sense of humor? Or can only the characters have a sense of humor? Can can is it an unreliable narrator, mm -hmm. or 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 is it just straightforward? There, it's um, I found the narrative voice by writing the blog, and then at some point, Uva was born in the blog. Long story, <clears throat> uh, and. Um, uh, and I figured, well, maybe I can try to make this into a novel. Mm -hmm. 
but I was still just, but that was just still me trying to be, all right, I have this story, I'll try to put it in a book. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I was 20, 29, 30 today, then maybe it would have been a podcast, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, you know, there's different media. Yeah. Um, but that's just how I went about it. Mm -hmm. But I'm still not, I'm still not, Trying to be an author. Right. <laughs> I'm, just, uh, I'm just trying to tell stories. Um, you know, it's interesting that that you bring up this idea of the narrator and the personality because when I think about all your books, the, the narrator is sort of that that person that doesn't really have a name but does have such a distinct personality in, in all the stories. And I'm thinking of anxious people. Um, and so, you know, you sort of start that novel like, this is a book about, this is a novel about idiots, which I love. <laughs> and um, by the way, no spoilers in case um, not all of you have read all the books we're going to discuss today. But if you haven't read Anxious People, it's it's a really perfect book for this time of year because it takes place at the end of one year, the beginning of the next. Um, and it's about the <clears throat> unlikely hostage situation, uh, lovable bank robber, um, huge hit in the United States. Um, and I'm wondering... Um, could you tell us what you think it is about that story in particular, those characters that you think resonated so deeply with so many readers? Anxious people? Yes. yes. <clears throat> well, the thing is that Anxious People was not supposed, you were not supposed to read Anxious People because I just wrote, I, um, we're not going to make this into a three hour lecture about my breakdown, but I had a breakdown <laughs> um, in 2017. Uh, because I, it, it turns out I did not handle success and attention well. Um, and uh, so I had a stress right now, mm -hmm. um, I thought. Mm -hmm. And then I went, I went to therapy and my therapist said, you do not suffer from stress. Uh, the, the nurses at the ER on a Friday night, they suffer from stress. <laughs> you suffer from pressure. Um, that's something different and we treat it differently uh, we go about things differently um, uh, but I uh, but I had anxiety issues and I had to go to therapy and it was a long very long journey uh, and complicated uh, my therapist had to listen to me <laughs> I had a lot to say um, <laughs> And he now has a very nice little summer house. And he's very well. And, um, but, but in that, during those therapy sessions, the, the, there was a lot of things that came up. But one of the things was that he told me very early on that you don't like yourself very much. And that's going to be a problem. That's going to be a problem wherever your life takes you, that you do not like yourself very much uh, and I had to go back and home and think about that and come back the next week and say you know this is why uh, this is why I'm not very good at leaving my family mm -hmm. like my kids and my wife they're fine with it they, they don't care <laughs> but, uh, but I can't because my breakdown came after a US tour mm -hmm. um, no offense. <laughs> uh, because I had, because that was just such a weird thing to me because I, you, you, you become a writer, you, this is a very long answer, I'm sorry about that. Oh. You, you become a writer, you spend eight hours a day alone in a room with people you have made up uh, who exist in a place that doesn't exist mm -hmm. other than in your imagination. And um, and then someone tells you, you know what you should do? You should go on tour. <laughs> you should meet people for a living. Like, that's not very, very seldom, I think, that's compatible traits. Uh, so I, but I did, and I went on tour, and I had a lot of panic attacks, and I had a lot of lying on the floor in the hotel room and calling my wife and saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I don't, I don't know who I am, and I don't know this person that they want me to be. I don't know who that person is, and this is a very strange experience, and, and, and uh, I couldn't handle it very well. So that was the beginning of the of the breakdown, and I went to therapy, 
my therapist got a cold. <laughs> and uh, I came out of therapy and I had this feeling and I, I had written at that point five novels uh, and a couple of novellas and I had just, I had written Bear Town and Us Against You, which was, and I had this idea that it was going to become a trilogy, but writing the first two in that, that just took everything out of me. And uh, there was a lot of research, there was a lot of listening to horrible, horrible stories. Uh, I felt a lot of pressure, I felt a lot of responsibility to tell these people's stories in a good way, so I had, I, I carried a lot of that around, and um, uh, and I was just lost, uh, and, and very, uh, then my wife and my kids described, well, you went to bed and you slept for two weeks, mm -hmm. uh, and then you came up and, 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 you know, you started to become a human being again. But I, uh, I didn't think I was going to write again at that point. So I started writing anxious people as a writing exercise. Like that was my, all right, I, I'm not going to be able to write again ever possibly. But if I am going to write again, I think I need something to just get me into writing again. So I started writing anxious people like a writing exercise. And I thought, you know, all right, I'll, I'll write about my therapy. Mm -hmm. And then I had this little thing, a theater play that I tried to write years before. That was about a hostage situation at an open house uh, where a bank robber runs into an open house and takes all the people who are there to look at an apartment hostage. Uh, it was comedy. It didn't work as a theater play because I am, turns out I don't know how to write a theater play. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, and I don't know how to write novels either, but no one is. Well, no one has stopped me, <laughs> but the theater people said no. <laughs> so I just had that lying around, and I started writing about my therapy, and I, that I, these two ideas kind of merged, and I started. But I still had like, I think, seventy-five percent into that book. I still thought that this is never going to get published. And if it is going to be get published, it's probably going to be the end of my career because this is when people find out that he is he has no idea what he's doing. Uh, he's uh, he's on the crazy train this one. And, uh, uh, so when it did get published, and I I say this in all sincerity, I, when it did get published, everyone who worked with it like. The, Everyone at my Swedish publisher, my American publisher, my, my agents, everyone had the same reaction to it. Like, I, you know what, Fred, I really like this, and I think it's it's some of the most personal thing you've written, and it's it's a comedy, but it also has this very strong theme of mental health, and, and, and I think you're onto something, but I don't know if people are going to get this. Yeah. That was the thing that kept coming back. I really like this. Don't get your hopes up because I don't know if this is going to find a broad audience because it might be a little too weird. And then it turned out that a lot of people were weird. <laughs> uh, but that's still the strangest thing that has happened. I think that's still the, the, the strangest thing that has happened all through my career is that that book made it to the New York Times bestseller list. That was the, the strangest, strangest thing. Um, so, uh, so that, so that's where we are. My therapist is doing doing well. Doing well. <laughs> uh, so, so that that's how we came up. Mm -hmm. That's um, so interesting to hear. It's funny you mentioned the play because I remember when I was reading it, I thought, oh, I could so totally see this on a you know on a stage because it it, it takes place in sort of that closed closed area. Um, and my next question, actually, you sort of touched on a little bit because so. The way that your publication schedule goes, you know, with the Bear Town trilogy, Bear Town, Us Against You, Anxious People, and then the winners, right? So um, I was asking uh, your readers online and fans, you know, what kind of questions they have. That's not how you do it. If you're a writer, you're not, <laughs> it's not the form. It's not you don't write a trilogy and then stop That's after up. the second book. And write yeah. it's completely different. The people are, is this the third part of the? <laughs> What's this? And then you write, then don't, it's not a good idea. Well, I think that's why so many readers are curious about whether when you started Bear Town, 
what your inspiration was and whether you saw it right from the beginning as three books or if you wrote one and you thought, oh, I've, I've got more to say about this place, this town. Um, what, what did that process look like for you? Was, did you know from the beginning that it was going to be three different No, books? I thought that I had this idea for three books. Mm -hmm. And I had, and I didn't know all the details of it, but I knew if I'm going to write three books, this is how it's going to end. Mm -hmm. I had the end of the arc. Mm -hmm. Is that how we say it? Yeah. yeah very fancy word. <laughs> the end of the the the, the whole. <clears throat> where is this going? Where are these characters going to end up? I had an idea like. If I write three books, this is how it's gonna end. I don't know everything in between, but this is how it's gonna. This is where we're going with it. Um, but I wrote the first book, and my agent said, "Maybe we just tell them one book. <laughs> Maybe not promise three. Mm -hmm. Let's see how this goes." Because my first three books have done very well <clears throat> in countries where hockey is not very big. Mm -hmm. South Korea, among other things. I was number one in South Korea. Yes, Rare Time was not one number one in South Korea. Uh, um, and uh, so there were a lot of countries when I, when Rare Time came out, where my career did not do very well all of a sudden. Uh, and that's not the agent's dream scenario. <laughs> so, uh, but then all of a sudden I started selling books in Canada. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because the, and no one had ever thought about that, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden that came. So it was. So I had this idea for three books, <clears throat> um, but we weren't sure that anyone would, would let us. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I, uh, you know, when I wrote the first two, and uh, I had my breakdown, and then mm -hmm. for the longest time I was looking for. If I'm gonna write the third one, it has to have. I have to have something to say. Sure. There has to be something that I want you to know. That I feel is worth your time, hopefully, mm -hmm. because you are because you can spend your time on a lot of things. You can watch Netflix or learn a language, or go for a nice walk, mm -hmm. or you know, there's there's a lot of things that you can do instead of writing reading my book and. Um, and then this became 700 pages. So I <laughs> had one or two things that I felt I wanted to say. Uh, uh, um, but Town, the whole trilogy, the whole idea came from me basically wanting, I wanted to tell a story about sports and I wanted to tell a story about the very, very best parts of sports. Yeah. Because I wanted my wife, who is the least interested in sports in the world. <laughs> Second, my, my father is less interested in sports than <laughs> she is. Um, I wanted her to understand why it was important to her. Mm -hmm. I wanted to try to tell the story to someone who is not into sports. And I wanted to see, can I tell a sports story to someone who is not interested in sport and still and make you understand why? Why this is important to a few crazy people? Um, like, why do people behave like morons when sports are involved? Like, why is it so? Um, so I wanted to do that because sports to me is like I found sports and books at the same time because I don't like reality. So I, when I was five years old, I figured out that all right, sports and books, these are my things because they are not real. They are not. You go. Tolkien and, and Lord of the Rings, that's basically the same thing. Like we know that elves and dwarves and knights and monsters and, and wizards, we know these things doesn't exist, but it feels real to us. And we know that this game here between the blue and the red team, and they're gonna put the ball in whatever, and everything. There's a social contract. We're 50,000 people in the stands. There's a social contract. Like all of us, we're gonna we're gonna pretend that this is important. <laughs> no, it's not. You know, it's not. we made this up. Uh, this is all made up. But we're going to pretend that this is important now because we need that. We need that escape. Because this, the real thing, it's a little too overwhelming sometimes. So we need, we need to go here and pretend that this is important for two hours. 
And that's going to be our little Luis. And uh, I wanted to tell a story about that. And I wanted to tell a story about a community. Because I look for small universes. I look for one street or one house, or and in this case, one small town. And I wanted to tell a story how about how people are interconnected mm -hmm. and how frustrating that is because most of the people are morons. Mm -hmm. And how, <laughs> how you are, you know, centered around other people. And uh, so so that's how it came about. And that's why the most important line, I think, all through the trilogy to me is what is a community, it's the sum total of our choices. Yes. That's what the trilogy is about. Mm -hmm. I could have just said that. Was no. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you sit down to write a book, when you have an idea, what do you are you somebody who likes to outline? I mean, you think about all your books. The thing that's so <laughs> exciting about them is that it's they're surprising, that the plot's surprising, the characters are surprising, and yet it's so believable. Like you get to the end and you're like, we were always headed here, even though I didn't quite see it. So when you sit down to write, do you have a process you follow? I mean, do you surprise yourself when, when you I wish I had a process. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> process sounds very nice. No, I know because I share an office with a the most gifted writer I know. Um which is very frustrating at times. Uh, he's called Niklas Napov Dog, weird name. Uh, but he has, um, his book is called The Wolf and the Watchman in the US. Uh, and it's historical fiction. It takes place in Stockholm in the 1800s. And it's a murder mystery, but it's in Stockholm in the 1800s. And everything is historically correct because he is, He is annoyingly intelligent, <laughs> and um, he has he has a process. He has spreadsheets, and he has, you know, he has a board on the wall, and they're you know like like serial killers have. <laughs> he has he he outlines everything so in so much details, mm -hmm. and he has so many books that he goes through, and everything is historically correct and everything. And I just have everything in my head, which makes my head a little bit messy at times, and me probably not easy to live with because there's a lot of that going on in my house with my kids like that. Oh. Uh, because I, I live somewhere else, I, I'm in my head. So I know there's no process, it's all in my head, uh, it's chaotic. Uh, for the longest time with every book, and this is not, I'm not exaggerating, with every book, for the longest time, the process is me going around feeling that I'm never going to pull this together. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. Whatever I did before was luck. Um, I can never pull this off again. The people who liked my previous books are going to hate this book. They're going to be really disappointed. And that's a real, that that dark hole that you go down, it's real. And it doesn't matter how many times you, you can be on any bestseller list you want. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's not how anxiety works. It's like people say, but you're so pretty. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. That's not how anxiety works. Right. Like your mom will tell you, but, but just don't think about it. That's not how anxiety works. It's the dark hole is real. And uh, so for the longest time I had this feeling that this is ne I'm never going to make it. It's never gonna, I'm never going to figure this out. No one is going to like this. Mm -hmm. And then you reach a point where you've written so much and you care so much about it. It becomes real to you, yeah. real to you. And you feel, all right, I'm going to finish it for me. No one's, that's what happened with anxious people. I'm, no, no one's going to read it. If they do, they're going to hate it. But I'm going to write it for me because now I need to get this out of it because it's real to me. And that's where something happens. As soon as you reach that point, you start writing for you, that's when something happens. And all of a sudden, something clicks and something happens and, uh, and, and you're onto something. And all of a sudden, you, oh, I know it's going to end now. Or, oh, I know I'm going to rewrite it now. But in this, I know what I did wrong. I know, I know what it is. I know what it is that I want. To say. I know what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. 
but you're out there searching. Uh, and that's what writing is to me. It's not, it's not having a spreadsheet. Uh, it's not, you know, I don't work in a bank or at an advertising agency or, or I don't go into work with this, well, this is a project and this is the, you know, yeah. we have a spreadsheet. This is, the, this is a presentation that I did yesterday. Mm -hmm. We're going to show the, the, you know, the board members. That's not how, it's just chaos, 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 yeah. chaos, chaos, and then all of a sudden something clicks. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the whole process. <laughs> it's not very useful information. <laughs> she wants to write, but that's what it is. It's just staying at it. Yeah. It's feeling really bad about yourself and feeling that your writing sucks. <laughs> but keeping at it. That's the whole that's what I tell young writers all the time. Do you have a do you have a, like a writing tip? Yeah, keep writing. Because if you keep writing, you're gonna. Because 99 percent, 99.9 percent of everyone who has ever told me I have a great idea for a novel, they never finish that novel. 99.9 percent have a great idea for a novel. Good for you. <laughs> you know what a novel is? Finished. <laughs> that, that's what a novel is. That's it. Everyone has a great movie idea. Everyone has a great TV idea. Everyone has a great movie idea. Everyone in the world <laughs> have at some point. You know what would make a great movie? That everyone. <laughs> so to beat ninety nine point nine percent of the competition, all you have to do is stay at it. Yeah. All you have to do is go up the next day and keep writing, mm -hmm. and the next day, and the next. That's how you beat them. That's how you get ahead. It's not. I don't. There are so many people in the world who have more talent mm -hmm. than I do. So many. So many. <laughs> Unbelievable amount. It's overwhelming at times. I go into a library like this. It's like, why would anyone in their right mind pick out one of my books out of all this? <laughs> you could choose anything. And you chose mine. Why would anyone do that? It's incomprehensible. It makes no sense. Um, But it's just staying at it. Mm -hmm. you, you, you stay on course and you write for you. Mm -hmm. You write what you like. And then it's still the greatest quote I've ever heard about writing is Grant Morrison, who is a writer and uh, has made graphic novels and Batman and all, all kinds of things. But he said he, he got asked at a, the signing. A woman came up to him. I'm paraphrasing now because I'm not, I don't understand the exact quote. And this is on YouTube now, so someone is gonna get it. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but she came up to him and she said something along the line of, "How is it that you, that I have never met, can write something that makes me cry?" And he said something along the lines of, "I don't know, but I can only assume it's an extension of me crying when I wrote it." And if I got asked to teach a course in creative writing. I would walk in, write that on the board, and walk out. <laughs> That's it. That's all it is. If you care, then maybe someone else would care. But if you don't care, if you're trying to trick the reader, well, this is going to scare you. If you're not scared, they're not going to be scared. If you don't cry, they're not going to cry. If you don't laugh, they're not going to laugh. If you don't feel something, because there's a bullshit radar. I'm sorry, you two. There's a, there's a radar in people where we know if you mean it or not. You can walk up on stage and sing something perfectly. Every note is perfect. You, you, you went to school, you sing this, you sing this perfectly. Mm -hmm. And no one feels anything. And then someone else comes up and it's not, it's not perfect. It's not hitting every note. It's not on cue. It's not, it's a little off. Everyone cries mm -hmm. because when well when she sang it, we could hear her heart breaking. That's it. You can't teach someone that. You can't go to school for that. You can't teach that in a class. Mm -hmm. It's not. She gave it her everything. The other one sang it like she was some thinking about grocery shopping. Like <laughs> was, she was just going through the motions, but she 
she she was dying out there. That's what it is. Like it's it's you got to you give it your you, you give it your everything. It was not an answer to your question. It, we got on. <laughs> You know, I something that you said in the acknowledgments of the winners that resonated with me just as a reader of yours is you said, you know, I gave everything I had to these books, and I hope you got something out of it. And I think that on every page of your books, you feel as as a reader that he gave everything he had. And I I wonder when you look back at writing and publishing the Bear Trown trilogy in particular, what do you think that story gave back to you as a, just a person? What did it give back to me? Mm -hmm. Well, on, on a technical level as a writer, uh, it was a new thing to me mm -hmm. because that was the first time that I have written out of more viewing points than one. Mm -hmm. Like my first three books, they had one camera, so to speak. We, we're going to follow this character around. Whatever this character does, we're going to go there. And uh, this was the first time that I said, we're going to follow this character, and now we're over here. And then we're over there. And then we're over there. And we're going to have maybe nine main characters. And, and um, it's always an interesting discussion when people start discussing who is the main character in Bear Town. Right. And people have opinions, strong opinions. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about it when I wrote. I never, there was not a single time when I wrote Bear Town that I thought, who is the main character? Because I didn't think that was important. Mm -hmm. But apparently, you know, a lot of writing classes yeah. teach you that you have to have a main character. Who's the main character? I don't know. It doesn't matter. The, the Tao, maybe, is the main character. Uh, so on a technical level, I just learned a lot because you learn by doing, you learn by going, you learn by doing, making mistakes. Uh, you learn by writing a chapter and showing it to someone that like, I don't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. All right, and, you know, I'll go back, I'll figure it out. Um, you learn by doing. And on a personal level, of course, that's going to be, that's, that's a six hour answer, but, but it's, um, uh, of course, it did something to me. It was my. Uh, it was a six-year project to begin with. Mm -hmm. it, it took up a lot of space in my life, and I did give it everything. And I tried to really, um, as I said before, tell you about the very best part of sports, but also the very, very worst parts of sports, like all of the parts of that culture that I'm ashamed of, and all of the things in the sports culture that I've feel that I should have been a, a stronger voice to to be opposed to. Uh, all of the times in the locker room where someone made a joke that I should have said, you know, hold on a minute. Um, all of the things that, you know, it was my, this was my way of looking myself in the mirror. Uh, and saying, all right, these are the very worst parts of me. Mm. These are the very worst parts of the sports culture that I love and is addicted to and really, really need this bubble. Yeah, yeah I'm a part of the problem. Uh, so when the really bad parts of sport, I'm a part of that problem. So what I tend to tell people is that the way that I wrote Fair Town is when people say, Oh, it's so believable that the you know the good people and the bad people, and you understand the bad people, but you understand their intentions. And <clears throat> I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that writing good people is easy. Uh, writing good people, most people can do that, but writing bad people is hard because you have to find the really worst parts of yourself. So you have to go into yourself and say, "All right, these are the very, these are the parts of me that I'm ashamed of." Uh, that's why I could write the people who made the real, really poor decisions, mm -hmm. and the real the people who choose sides and choose the wrong sides. Well, they're for me. They're for me. That's why they. What? That's why you believe them because they're for me. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the good people, well, good people are, you know, they're they're easier to write. So what? Because they're good. Because they're going to make the right decision. They're going to, you know, they're going to do the right thing. But the people who make, the, the people who at heart are maybe not bad people, but make very bad choices and end up on the wrong side of something because they believe that they're defending something they love. Well, here's where it gets complicated. And you have to find out in yourself. So it's, um, so that's why I have to tell people, you know, I'm not a, this didn't come from me trying to lecture anyone. It didn't come from me trying to be, you know, the, this, this is a story about good people. There are very good people in the story, but it's mostly about normal people fragile and, and complicated and, and flawed, and they make very, very poor decisions. And I try to tell you how uh, someone who is trying to be a decent human being, maybe views themselves as a decent human being like I do, <coughs> but looking back, oh, that was a very poor decision. Like, I was on the wrong side of that. I should not, I should have been over there, but it was hard. And it took too much courage, maybe. Mm -hmm. And all of my friends were over here, all those people I grew up with, and all of my neighbors, and everyone else was over here. So, but I should have been over there, but it was hard. And it was too hard, it was easier to be over here. So I stayed over here. And that's what the story is about. So I, I that's what I took, I, I think it was, uh, this was my coming of age. Thing. It was just me becoming a parent, and, and um, it took six years. I mean, it, it, my kids were three and six when I started writing. Mm -hmm. They're nine and twelve now. Mm -hmm. You know, we went through a lot. Uh, my my daughter started playing football, our football, not your football. The rest of the world can. <laughs> she started playing football. She played. I mean, during the course of me writing Bear Town. I was the assistant coach of her football team for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. and that was our whole life. Yeah. It was our whole life. Three, four days a week, it was just packing bags, we're going somewhere, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna go play at you know, four and a half years, that was our life. And we had that all and that all of that is in the winners. And I didn't know that when I was writing Bear Town that that was going to happen. But all of that, so all of that went into it. And um, all of that experience. And all of me, you know, which, which ended after four and a half years with us being at a game and a lot of adults behaving in a way that me and my daughter looked at each other and said, this is not for us. This is not for us. Uh, and uh, so part of that, I think the title of the winners came from that moment when she she left the field and we just looked at each other. We went to the car, we sat down, and she said, I don't think I want to play anymore. And I think, you know what? I don't think I want you to either. Because this was just, they were I don't know, seven years old, eight years old. And the parents are screaming like, it's the World Cup. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, one, a seven, eight year old falls down and loses the ball, like makes a terrible mistake, falls down, stumbles and falls down. Worst moment of that kid's life. Mm -hmm. And the other team scores. And 70 parents go like, yeah! <laughs> They're like, that's a kid, like, that's a, that's a seven-year-old lying there. Like, that's that's a child lying there crying now. What are you doing? Like, what, what's going on? Oh, yeah, we scored. They're kids. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, but we won the game. Who cares? Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's made up. 
<laughs> no one cares. <laughs> what are you going to tell me when this kid is an adult, like 25 years old? Yeah, but we won. You remember when we won that game? Yeah. You know what? That, that today I became a winner. And that's why I'm a hedge fund manager now. <laughs> that's not how life works. It's not. But this was a teaching moment where you could, you know what you could have done? You could have told the other parent to shut the hell up. You could have gone over to that kid and helped her out. That's what you could have done. You know, that's that's when we stopped playing football. This is on YouTube now. This is gonna this is gonna haunt me. But, <laughs> but we had that's when I you know this is a very, very long answer. I'm sorry about that. But that's kind of where the title of the winners came from. Because my daughter left the field and we just looked at each other and we felt this is enough for us. Like it's gotten too serious. And we went home, we, went, we sat in the car, and we talked about the way that we love practice. Yeah. Me and my daughter, we, we have that. And I played, you have to understand, I played football for my entire life. Mm -hmm. I played football from, from when I was like five, six years old. I kept playing when I was like 23, 24, when you're not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> when there's, a, I don't know what you call that in the United States, but there, there will be like a, a league of, uh, you know, yeah, rec league, yeah. Rec you 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 play in a park basically, yeah. Yeah. and every every time someone like injures their knee, <laughs> for life. <laughs> um, but that you know, I, I I love the sport, I love it. But that was just the point where we looked at each other, me and my daughter, like we like to practice, yeah. we like to you know, we like being in the car. After the game, going for a hot dog. That's the part we like. <laughs> we like having, like, you know, I, I like, you know, I, I bought a Ford Explorer with the seven seats. <laughs> like, I enjoyed having, like, a bunch of kids in the car listening to horrible music <laughs> and going someplace and then being happy and excited mm -hmm. in a Saturday morning, like 6 30. <laughs> I enjoyed that. that. That was my, that was our favorite part of it. But the thing, like the game, who cares who wins? Like who cares? I don't. It's you go in, you do your best, we compete. But it doesn't like, you know, fifty parents screaming over there. We would just no. no this, is this what it's going to be like now? Yeah, this is going to. This is what it's going to be like every time. Like, this, this is not for us. And then I talked to another parent afterwards in our team. And I said to him, and he said, well, too bad you're, you're leaving the, the, the team and everything. And, you know, we, we so much enjoyed having you and, and it was so much fun. And, uh, and I said to him, well, you know, me and my daughter, I think we have this in common. We figured that out that day that we don't like to compete. We don't enjoy competing. That's just stressful and anxiety filled for us. We don't enjoy competing. We don't like competing. We love to play, but we don't enjoy competing. And I could see in his eyes that he had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> and that's when I figured, that's in the winners that I figured out like, oh, oh, these are two, two different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And the people who love to compete, the people who are like, I love a competition. I just love, you know, something happens with you during the competition. I can never explain this to you. Mm -hmm. I can never. Because it's just because there was a goal score. We were excited. You could not contain yourself. Right. And you were there for your kid. And you felt this is the greatest day in our lives. And so you so you scream. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely no way that I can walk over and explain to you, yeah. But what about yeah, but it's a competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah all right. It's not for us. And, uh, and that was a huge turning point in my life because I think up until that point, I kind of thought that I liked competition. Mm -hmm. I kind, I think I convinced myself that maybe I do like it because I have been doing it for so many years. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, okay. this is not for us. And that that whole when you have that moment with your child. Seven, eight year old, when you both look and you're right, like, you know what? There's nothing wrong with these people. They're nice people. 
This is just not for us. Mm -hmm. You can have it, keep it. It's not for us. We're not going to make you change anything. We're not going to. We're not going to try to make you change the rules or 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 adapt to us. We're just going to tell you that this is not for us. We're going to work more. We're going to go do something else. Uh, and she found other activities, like she climbs, mm -hmm. and she does other things. She goes to theater classes. And, um, but 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 that was that was the things that I learned. Like I learned, like I use everything. That's also when I talk to writers. Like, what do you, you use everything? Like everything, everything that you find, you go looking for things, and everything you find, you, you use that. You know, you're having a horrible experience. You're crying. You're you're in a bad place in life, whatever. You use that. You, you take that and you use it. You hear a funny dialogue at the grocery store, someone is in, a, in an argument. You use that. You steal that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we are ready to move on to the question and answers. I think I'm pretty sure the audience has questions and answers. We're going to run microphones to you so that both the listeners at home can hear the questions and those on the audio loop can hear it. And while we wait for the first question, Put your hand up and Kristen or Gail will bring you a microphone. And I have to say that um, for me, I think um, Benjamin Ovich is the character from Bear Town. Really, he will always, always stay with me. <laughs> How many people are going to agree that Benji, Benji stays with you long fan after? Favorite. Yeah, yeah, fan favorite for Benji. Um, something about Benji. Hey, Jane. Okay, got a question? <laughs> Hi, thank you for Hi. being here. Um, my, my first question is essentially, uh, how come the therapist has a summer cottage, but you had to share an office? I wasn't sure. <laughs> 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 it's kind of connected, you think about it. It makes sense. Um, 2017 was a hard year for me as well, and your books got me through it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know how you felt once you let all those characters out in the world, whether it was Benji or whether it was Ovid or it was Dot Marie or anybody. And once you put them out in the world to the rest of us, what was that like um, to then suddenly hear strangers talking about these wonderful characters, these wonderful people you've been living with for so long? What was it like to hear it on a critical perspective and also on a, on a fandom level as well? It's the critical uh, aspect of it is easier. That is my short answer. It's easier to because when I get a bad review, it's just well, yeah. But I could be driving a forklift, so <laughs> I'm doing okay. <laughs> it's you didn't like the book. Well, you, you, maybe it wasn't for you. Right. Uh, it's all right. It doesn't have to be for you. It doesn't have to be for everyone. It, it's okay. Um, I've had some very nice people walk up to me at signings like, "Oh, I really love this book. This, not so much." And <laughs> <laughs> they're holding the book. This, not so much. <laughs> it's just the critical part. You. You get used to that, and I think my perspective, my wife helps me a lot with that. Yeah, but you know, yeah, yeah. you could be driving a forklift. This is not a real job. <laughs> you know, get over yourself. Um, uh, but I think the other part is uh, the personal part. Uh, it's a little bit overwhelming at times, if I'm going to be honest with you. Um, because it's not, and it's not always connected to me, but people come up and talk to about anxious people because they were going through mental health issues themselves, or they had someone very close to them commit suicide, or whatever it was. And that's now intertwined with my book. So when they start talking about my book, they start talking about that event in their life. And it becomes very, very raw and personal. And that can be overwhelming at times. And it can be overwhelming. I mean, it can be um, with Benjamin Ovich. It, it was, um, I felt a lot of responsibility. I felt a lot of pressure because he meant so much to so many people. And people wrote emails 
that was, was just the most personal things that I've ever had. And, and uh, so it becomes a little overwhelming at times. Uh, and uh, I think with the winners, it was, so that was a kind of a fight that I had to try. And I have to finish this the way that I thought about it to begin with. Like I have to stay true to the story and to me, and some of you are not going to like me for it, but I have to stay true to what where I was heading with this. Um, but, but that's um, so, um, so so a little overwhelming at times. But the critical thing is, you know, we get it. Thank you. You're my favorite forklift driver. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> you went from this side of the room. There we go. So I work in the field of ESL, and this is a second language, so I'm really interested in translation, and I watch a bunch of foreign shows with subtitles. So since your books are translated into English, I was wondering if you ever find that there's something lost in translation, either in a character that you've created or just something overarching in the book that you think just didn't really translate as, as you had felt it into English. Um, has that ever been an experience for you? Usually I think the translation improves. <laughs> uh, it's uh, there are some things word puns rarely work in translation that's I think people ask me like have you changed over since because when I write a wrote a Michael Uwe you have to understand that the reason for him being named Uwe is because it's such a common name in Sweden for that generation of a man it would be like John or I don't know Bill <laughs> the reason it was funny in Swedish was a man called John or a man called Steve. It's a stupid title for a book. It was funny. <laughs> so I thought, if you see that in a store, you'll go like, why would anyone name a book that? <laughs> and you would turn it over and maybe I could hook you. It was a joke. And then it got translated. There was, and it turns out, Uwe is an unbelievably weird name in every country. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't quite work. Uh, so sometimes, sometimes, uh, so, so I, I, I changed a little bit over the course of the, like I do less word puns, because word puns are, like there's a, there's a word pun in a Makaluva with the neighbor being an Iranian, which is also a Persian, but the word for Persian in Swedish is pash. Pa you're, being a pash is also being an annoying person. <laughs> like being being a lot, like being a too too much. That the oil it was uh, you know it was a pash. And and these words sound the same. So that's at some point she says, I'm not a and I'm, I'm not Arabic Arabic. I, I'm 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 I'm, I'm I'm a, I'm a Persian. He's like, yeah, you are. <laughs> that's a joke in Swedish. It did not work in any other way. Um, so, so it's it's. Uh, so I do less word puns now. I think. Um, and there are sometimes you read things that 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 you feel, oh, this is not the way that I would have translated. But you have to trust the translator, and I think. To try to make it short, you have to find a translator who gets your rhythm more than anything else. Because language is rhythm to me, and especially jokes. Jokes are rhythm. Like if you mess up the rhythm, it's not going to work. Uh, so you have to have a translator who gets your rhythm. So when they translate, they don't use the exact words you would use. And maybe, like, some of my translators, they use what do you call it, semicolon? Is that a, you know, that I would never use that. I don't know how to use that. It's very complicated. You can mess that up. Don't do it. But if you don't, if you master the semicolon, you do not use it. It's dangerous. It's the third way. Then my translator uses it. I'm like, why would you? Now people think that I, <laughs> um, but that's just, uh, you have to accept that and you have to just go with it and you have to find translators who you feel get you. Uh, do you get my sense of humor? Do you get this story? Do you like the story? And still the, 
most important thing. You like this stuff. If you don't like it, it's not going to work. Um, so that's what you're looking for. But it is it is complicated, and uh, sometimes I work a lot with the translation. Sometimes I don't work with it at all. Sometimes it just works. Sometimes I feel like I don't know about this. And then my editor, Peter Borland, who has been my American editor for my entire career, he says, no, this works. Yeah, but in Swedish, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> this works. Uh, so, so you know, you trust people. You find good people, you trust them. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, so we have another question from the other side of the room, or um, let's see. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, so, Friedrich, I have to say, a Man Called Uva is the first and only book that ever moved me to tears. And it's also the first and only book that forced me to get a new wardrobe. <laughs> I was in college reading your book. I couldn't put it down. And it moved, my clothes were in the dryer and moved so far between people saying, can this dude just get his laundry already? That I think they just got up and left at one point. So thank you. It forced me to get better clothes after that as well. Uh, my question though. I owe you money though. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, you posted something on Instagram a couple months ago, whenever it was, about making things smaller. I found that interesting when I look back on your books, and I, did, I had never thought about that, and it made a lot of sense when I thought about the way you can actually take each of your novels and bring them down to one place or one person, one room. How have you felt in your comments earlier in the talk, how have you felt you've applied that to your, to your personal life, with your family, or with writing, whatever it may be? If you can just expand upon that, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I think it was, uh, to put that into some context, I have an Instagram account. I don't have TikTok because I'm not that young, but I did, did get an Instagram account. And I started a couple of months ago, I started writing, writing down, like writing tips. And these might be very bad tips because I most of the time don't know what I'm doing, but I, you know, here they are. If they don't work, do the opposite. But one of the writing tips was make things smaller, um, which was what you referred to. And the, the, it's basically that I try to tell people who ask me about writing that try making your ideas, ideas a little smaller. Like it's very nice that you have this idea. Oh, it's an epic drama. Drama. It centers around six generations of women, and it takes place, you know, we're in five different continents and in space. And <laughs> that's awesome. It's awesome if you can pull it off, but also very, very difficult to pull off as a first novel. I, you know, it's just my five cents. Um, try to make your idea smaller. Try to find. That's my only trick. Uh, Amanda Luba takes place in one street. Um, my second novel, my grandmother asked me to tell you she's sorry. It was one apartment building, mostly. And the rest of it took place in the imagination of a seven-year-old. Um, it's, it's just I try to make it as small as I can. Beartown has a lot of people, but it's a small town. I look for small universes, I look for small places. I try not to, I don't want my world to be complicated because then I have to describe it. I'm not very good at describing things. I'm good at describing people. I'm good at <coughs> emotions and people interacting. I'm not great at, you know, there's a tree. Could you write two pages about the tree? No, 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 no. I don't know how to do that. Some writers can. Some writers can describe a tree for two pages and you're captivated. Like, this is the best I've ever, I, I'm, I'm very into this tree. <laughs> but if you're not, if you're not that good of a writer, which I'm not, make things smaller. Make your idea a little smaller. Try to, um, um, <clears throat> try to not overextend yourself because then you have better chances of actually finishing the story. Like try to write a novella. You know, tell yourself, I'm gonna tell this story in five pages. And then, you know, tell the story in five pages and then expand it and expand it and expand it and expand it. And then all of a sudden it's 700 pages. <laughs> and, but, but you know, but start somewhere, don't, because otherwise you're like, 
yeah, I've been working on my novel now for 11 years. <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe, maybe take a break, write a novella, and just finish something, because you have that sense of accomplishment. And I think that's very important if you want to be a writer, that once in a while you have to give yourself a little, I've finished this. I can now go show it to people and say, this is not a work in progress, this is something I've finished. It might not be very good, but it's something. Here you are. That's how you get going. That's my... Okay, so I think we'll do one last question, maybe from the middle, since we've had, done all on the sides. Okay. This is my fault for not being, I'm, I don't know how to answer short. <laughs> you have to, yes and no questions. The answers are perfect. So I'm um, curious why the winners is not about soccer when you've spent your whole life in soccer. What made you pick a different sport to explore for that trilogy? Uh, why I chose hockey? Yeah. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> Uh, two very short things. The first is that hockey, hockey was the only sport that I didn't play as a kid. I played everything, but my, my parents worked a lot. So the deal was you can do any sport you want as long as you can get there by yourself. And I couldn't get to hockey by myself because uh, you need a lot of gear. and you, you need someone to give you a ride. So, uh, so I played everything else, but I love hockey. I'm obsessed with hockey. I followed hockey my entire life which made me kind of an outsider and an insider. I know a lot of people who play hockey, but I've never played myself, which makes me, if I was solely an insider, I don't think I would have written the book the way I did. You need to be a little bit of an outsider, but you can't be as much of an outsider that you don't understand what's going on, because then it's not believable. Then you're an academic writing a paper on something that you have never encountered. It's um, so it's that, and it's also that I was um, hockey is extremely hard. It's extremely difficult to become good at hockey. No one starts playing hockey at 15 and becomes good at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. No one. Um, it's unbelievably difficult. Um, it takes so much, so many different skills. And it takes so much time, and there's so much gear. You have to, you know, drive back and forth, and uh, it takes an hour to get all the gear on to a seven-year-old, and it takes an hour to get all the gear off. And so I, the reason I think basically is because I wanted, I wanted the story to be about family, uh, because all my stories are, and I was fascinated. I think. What stuck with me what, for years was the fact that everyone I know who is into hockey says, the parents say, well, we're a hockey family. I have never in my life heard someone say, yeah, we're, we're, a, we're a basketball family. <laughs> or we're a track and field family. We're a fencing family. <laughs> never heard that. I've never heard someone say that. I've never I was about heard to say I'm a hockey mom and we're a hockey family. So I was about to back. I'm, I'm back. I'm I could identify I, as a hockey I family. Just, I just never heard. I mean, you have the term soccer mom in the U.S., but that 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 doesn't mean the same thing as a hockey family. Being a hockey family means we have zero time for anything else. <laughs> you know, we're a hockey family. It means I don't have time to be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> We will never, I will never ask you. <laughs> That's what it means. It means one of our kids started playing hockey, and now the entire family plays hockey. You know, the, the, the other siblings, they're not that into hockey. They still, they, it's still what they do. What was your childhood like? Well, I was sitting, freezing, watching my brother play hockey. That's my, that's my childhood. It's, it takes everything. Like, everyone has to be here all in. Um that's what I was fascinated about. That, that was why I chose it. I like people who are obsessed. <laughs> uh, I um I have if you if you don't have anything in your this is one of the first lines in Bertha. Uh never trust anyone who doesn't have anything in their life that they're obsessed about. Like if you don't have anything in your life that you're a little too interested in, we have nothing. 
Uh, so that's what I look for. That's so hence hard. And I think we were talking uh, just before we came out um, in the back, because um, I grew up in Canada, um, and about hockey culture and how pervasive and how much Bear Town is what put um, Frederick Bachman on the map in Canada was because that was the book that Canadians <coughs> understood. They understand hockey culture. And uh, that man, who, man called Uve didn't take off in Canada until Bear Town came out. And then they're like, oh, here's a guy that writes about hockey. We'll get behind that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gave me the tip that I should write a book, book about curling. Yes. <laughs> if you really want to hit the Canadians, do the curling. Um, so anyhow, thank you both so much for a wonderful conversation. Um, Amy Joe, once again, you've been a fantastic moderator. We're looking forward to Anne's sons coming up. And, and Frederick, do you have a book in the pipeline or you just been kind of focused? I know you have your wife here with you who is involved with a man called Otto coming out this week on the project, so let's move out of that. Um, has that been taking up all your time, the movie and the book tours, or you've got something in the pipeline for us? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not involved in the movies at all, because okay. I'm not allowed in meetings. <laughs> <laughs> because I can't shut up. <laughs> uh, I'm not a team player. <laughs> uh, so, no, Neda does all of that. We, that's how we divided it uh, after after it became too big, uh, uh, we had to divide it, and we had to decide that if we got, if we are going to let people make movies and TV shows and, and uh, theater plays and all of the things that are going on, um, someone has to be in charge, and it can't be me. <laughs> uh, so Nella just took over. Uh, so now that's I'm um, I'm in charge of everything in imagination. And that is in charge of everything in reality. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. This is how we divide the company. Some people say, is it hard to work together? We don't work together. <laughs> she brings me to zero meetings. Uh, but, uh, um, but, but in the, the, in the writing sense of, uh, I've been looking for stuff, uh, for a couple of months. I, I don't really know where I'm going. I have two, maybe three different ideas that I'm working on. This is not what the publisher and the agents want to hear, but <laughs> I don't know yet. I'm stumbling around a little bit because I'm looking for something the same way that I did with Bear Time. I think I was looking for, all right, I'm going to write something maybe in a little bit of a different way. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm not going to switch genres, but maybe I'm, I'm looking for something else. And um, and I don't know what, what will come out of it. Sometimes out of these kind of, I, there's a novella that comes out or something. Sometimes that happens, but um, uh, but I don't know yet. I think maybe I stumbled onto something on the plane over here when I was sleeping. And I started writing, and I wrote for two hours, and she woke up. No, <laughs> she was like, could you give me a half a moment? I'm like, read it. Um, so maybe that's something. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But I think uh, um, yeah, I think maybe there will be something shorter. <laughs> well, whatever comes out next, please know that you're always welcome to come back to Princeton Public Library at any time, and um, we would love to host you again, maybe even in a bigger venue since this one's sold out so quickly. So um, thank you again. Uh, for our audience on the live stream, we are going to bid farewell, and uh, we're going to be moving to the book signing portion of the event. So for those of you who are in the room with us, please remain seated. And we'll be giving you some instructions. And I think Ariel and Lisa are going to bring Frederick out the side door and around to his signing area. So, yeah. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs>